We're really excited to be here. I'm Robert, and this is Stephanie. We're both grad students at UC Berkeley, um, and we're going to tell you about Ray, which is a project we've been working on uh, together along with a number of collaborators, both at Berkeley and outside of Berkeley. So Ray is an open source system for writing parallel and distributed Python applications, and it's specifically designed to support machine learning workloads. So distributed computing comes up all over the place in machine learning. Um, and these new workloads are stressing, are pushing the limits of existing systems, uh, so much so that machine learning researchers and machine learning practitioners are not uh, using existing standard distributed systems. Instead, they're often building new systems entirely from scratch for each new application that they're working on. And AlphaGo from DeepMind and Dota from OpenAI are two good examples of this, but there are many examples. Um, so there's a lot of redundant engineering effort right now in machine learning. In fact, uh, deploying a machine learning application often requires machine learning practitioners to spend a lot of time engineering systems to be distributed, to be more performant, um, to be faster, to parallelize code, and things like that. So I'm going to tell you more about what Ray, is, what Ray is, what we're building, how we're trying to solve this problem. And Stephanie will dive into the technical details of what ideas we needed to use to build a scalable and distributed uh, and fault-tolerant system. So here's a high-level depiction of what we're building. Ray is the underlying distributed system, and it also uh, hosts a number of, of libraries on top that support the different components of the machine learning ecosystem. This, this list is by no means exhaustive, um, but these are examples of standard components that appear over and over in many machine learning applications. Uh, I'm going to come back to this slide, but first I want to contrast this with the existing picture in the machine learning ecosystem. So here's what it looks like today. When we think about machine learning, we often think of training, machine learning training. Um, so this could mean taking a deep neural network and training it to recognize objects and images. It could mean uh, training a reinforcement learning agent to, um, to play Atari games or to solve some other task. Of course, uh, training is only part of the picture. Once you've trained your model, you need to take that model and do model serving. In other words, use the model to generate predictions or actions uh, in production. And of course, uh, hyperparameter search is another standard component of machine learning, the machine learning lifecycle. This means essentially running multiple experiments with different configurations uh, to find the, the right uh, val uh, settings of the, the configuration. And also, you need to, in order to run these experiments, you often need data. You need to load that data from somewhere, process the data, transform it, uh, feed it into your application. Um, and that data may come from a streaming data source as well. So all of these boxes represent computational patterns or components that appear in, in many machine learning applications. And today, each of these components is implemented as a standalone distributed system. So here are examples of different distributed systems for these specific components. You have tools like Horovod and distributed TensorFlow for training. You have tools like Vizier for hyperparameter search, uh, MapReduce and Hadoop for data processing, uh, things like that. And the, this is great. These systems are all very powerful, very uh, specialized, and very good at what they do. But this poses a serious challenge for applications that are cross-cutting and want to integrate many of these different components within a single application. So as soon as you want to start having a tight coupling between training and serving um, and, and data ingest and all of these things in a single application, then you're either gluing together a number of existing systems or you're taking the approach that a lot of people take, which is to just throw all this away and build a new system from scratch uh, for your application. Um, so what we're working on is trying to take all of these, uh, these components, which today are standalone systems, and reimagine re them as libraries on top of a single distributed system. So here we're building Ray, which is the underlying distributed system, along, and we're also building these libraries on top which uh, support the different components of the machine learning lifecycle. Um, now, it's already you know, really interesting and really valuable to be able to do each of these boxes individually, but we're, what we're excited about and where a lot of the potential really comes from is being able to enabling applications that integrate all of these different components together and enabling new things that are difficult to do today. So um, this is a a picture of what we're working on, and now I'm going to describe the different uh, abstractions within Ray. So at the highest level of abstraction, we have a set of libraries 
targeting the machine learning ecosystem. Some of these are already fairly mature, such as our libraries for hyperparameter search and distributed reinforcement learning. Others we're working on right now. Um, and you'll notice all of these libraries have very different computational patterns, very different uh, systems requirements and performance requirements. So it's difficult, in order to support these on top of a single system, you have to have a very general and flexible and expressive underlying programming model. It would be difficult uh, to support all of these on top of a single system like Hadoop, which um, targets a specific computational pattern. So to get expressivity and generality, we have an underlying programming model based on tasks and actors. This is essentially taking um, functions and classes, right, which are two core concepts in programming languages, and translating those into the distributed setting. So we provide the ability to take arbitrary functions and execute those remotely and asynchronously as tasks, and we provide the ability to take arbitrary stateful objects uh, or classes and instantiate them as services that you can talk to through a certain API. Um, so I'll say more about what the API looks like and how you use that uh, in a real-world example in a second, um, but this is where the, the ex expressivity and the generality is coming from. Underneath the programming model, we have a backend which, um, which handles things like scheduling, failure handling, uh, object transfers, uh, resource management, and um, these kinds of, of tasks. And the, uh, the, the core data structure that the backend reasons about is a dynamically constructed graph of task dependencies. Um, and Stephanie's going to talk more about how we make that scalable, how we uh, implement that, and what the challenges there were. Um, so before I dive into the API, I want to mention that Ray is an open source project. We're developing this on GitHub. And um, it's a fairly young project, but it's growing quickly. The green line indicates where we had our first release about a year ago, and we just really, we're working on 0.6 right now. Uh, we have a growing number of contributors, both inside and outside of Berkeley. And this, is, uh, uh, this includes substantial contributions from companies using Ray. Um, so we have a, an increasing number of production use cases. And one uh, use case I want to highlight is from Ant Financial in the upper left corner. So Ant Financial um, processes a substantial chunk of the, of the financial transactions that happen in China. Um, and they've used Ray to build a, um, a tool or system for detecting money laundering and other forms of fraud. So the interesting thing here is that um, it's a very complex application. You have a streaming transactions coming in, which contribute to building up a graph of, of financial transactions, and you need to be able to dynamically query this graph. And the previous iteration of this tool they had before using Ray uh, required stitching together three different distributed systems to implement the functionality they needed. And they were able to use Ray to consolidate that down to a single distributed system. Um, so this is one of the kinds of applications that becomes easier when you have a general purpose underlying system. OK, um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the API looks like. So here are two regular Python functions. Uh, the specific details don't matter. We can, take, uh, we can add this ray.remote decorator. And now, if I invoke one of these functions, so I call zeros.remote, um, what that does is it submits a task. It generates a task, which is handed off to the back end, which schedules it on some machine and assigns it to some worker, where it'll execute uh, asynchronously and eagerly. Um, and the actual function invocation that you're running in Python, this zeros.remote call, will return immediately um, and, uh, without blocking. Um, and that will return this ID1 object, which is a future, or an object ID, re representing the eventual output of the computation. Um, now if I submit another task, then, that will, uh, then these two tasks can execute in parallel because there are no dependencies between these tasks. And this picture on the, left hand, on the right hand side is um, a depiction of the, the data structure that the back end is keeping track of. Um, so the, the white circles are tasks, and the, the blue squares are, uh, represent the, the outputs of those tasks. And as you can see, there are no dependencies between these tasks. We can take the futures that are output by these two tasks and pass them as inputs into a third task. Um, and that uh, constructs, that uh, defines an implicit dependence of the third task on the first two tasks. So the third task won't, the dot task won't actually be able to execute until the first two tasks have finished. Um, 
although the, th the three lines of Python that you're actually writing will return immediately. Um, so you run these three lines, that constructs this graph, and then as the object dependencies become available, the tasks will execute. And if you want to block and wait for the computation to finish and retrieve the results, you can call ray.get to do that. This will block uh, and then actually return the output of the task. Um, so if you're familiar with composable futures, this, is, uh, this should look fairly familiar. It's a very powerful abstraction, and it lets you build scalable applications uh, pretty easily out of the box. One thing this doesn't do is it doesn't let you share mutable state between multiple tasks. And that's actually very important for machine learning. Um, mutable state comes up all over the place. It could be the state, the weights of a neural network. It could be the state of some simulator. Uh, it could be some encapsulation of some interaction with uh, the real world. And so to encapsulate state, we uh, are using an actor abstraction. So here's a Python class. It has a, it, it's just a toy example. It has a counter, and it has a method for incrementing the counter. Like before, we add this remote decorator, and now when we create one of these counter objects, what that does is it starts a new process somewhere in the cluster with this, uh, the counter object state. And method invocations on that object translate into tasks that are assigned to the counter actor and executed on that actor. Um, and like before, these tasks return futures. Um, you can invoke multiple tasks, and um, each a uh, actor task is implicitly dependent on the one that executed right before it. Um, and these tasks actually share the state of the counter process and can mutate it. And but like before, you can call ray.get to actually block and retrieve the results of the computation. Um, so these are two different um, abstractions. You have tasks and actors. But they actually, uh, under the hood, they're all um, working on top of the same dynamic task graph abstraction. And um, mutable state is encoded in the graph abstraction. And these things are very interoperable. It's not the case that you either use tasks or actors. In this, as in Python, you use both functions and classes together. Here you can compose these things together. They can be nested within each other. And there are a lot of different, um, they interoperate pretty seamlessly. So now I'm going to give you an example of how you actually can use these. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, show you on my laptop. You can use these tools together to implement um, an actual interesting example. So if you're familiar with the term parameter server, uh, this is, comes up in machine learning and distributed training. You have uh, the setup is you have one or more parameter server processes and one or more worker processes. Um, here, a parameter server is essentially a key value store. It holds the weights of a machine learning model, for instance, the weights of a neural network or the coefficients of a linear model. And the workers run in a loop where they, the workers each have some data, and they compute updates to the model and send those updates to actually update the parameters, and then they get the latest parameters, and then they just run this in a loop. Um, so a parameter server is something that's typically uh, implemented and, and shipped as a standalone system, kind of like a database or a, a key value store. But here, um, we're implementing, I'll show you how we can implement a parameter server as a simple application in a few lines of Python on top of Ray. Um, so let's see. Um, so I'm going to start up um, Python. And um, hopefully this is large enough. And I'm um, going to import Ray. And then I'll call ray.init, which starts the relevant Ray processes. That includes a scheduler and an object store. Stephanie's going to talk more about the architecture uh, in a few slides. Um, so if you were, this is on my laptop, but if you were running on a large cluster, this is the only line that would be different. OK, so um, I'm going to import uh, a few things. So now if I were to um, define a, a parameter server as a Python object, this essentially, it needs to have some parameters. Um, so we're going to just initialize its parameters to a vector of zeros for simplicity. Um, and then it has a method for getting the parameters, getting the latest parameters. And in this case, that's just, all we're going to do is return the parameter vector. Um, and it also needs to have a method for updating the parameters, which will take some sort of gradient update. And then we'll, uh, there are a lot of different update rules you could use here. But what we're going to do is just add the gradient to the parameter vector. So now, um, to uh, 
translate this into the distributed setting, we can add this remote decorator. And now if I, I'm going to uh, try to move the bottom of the screen up a little bit. Um, OK, so now if I were to actually um, create one of these objects, that's, what that does is that's starting a new process somewhere in the cluster. And then method invocations, like if I call getprams.remote, that um, sends a, a task off that runs on this process and returns a future. And if I want to block and retrieve the results, that's, I can call ray.get, which is, um, uh, yeah, which is, that's actually retrieving the output. OK, so that's the, in this picture, that's starting one of, we've just started one of these parameter server boxes, these processes. Um, so the next thing we want to do is start some workers. So I can define some worker tasks, um, which are essentially, they can just be functions which take a handle to the parameter server. And they're going to do, they're just going to run in a loop. So maybe we'll do 100 iterations. They're going to do three things. They're going to get the latest parameters, compute a gradient update, and then send the update to the parameter server. Uh, so to get the latest parameters, it's just a matter of calling ray.get on um, p the parameter server dot get params. Um, and uh, then we're going to compute a gradient update. Here I'm just going to make up a pretend uh, gradient. Uh, but this is where you would use TensorFlow. This is where you would uh, use the data that you also have available um, to actually compute the gradients. Um, and we'll say that takes some small amount of time. And then we're going to send the update to the parameter server. OK, so this defines the worker task. Now we can start up a few workers and pass in a handle to the parameter server. So here I'm starting three workers. Um, and then if we go back and actually get the parameters, you can see they're being updated in the background. So what we did here is we, um, going back to this picture, um, we started some workers and, and wired them up to communicate with the parameter server. So now we have some parameter servers and some workers, and they're talking with each other. Um, and the exciting thing here, like I mentioned, is that um, a parameter server is usually something that is implemented as, as a standalone system. And here we're able to recreate a, a toy version of that in a few lines of Python. Um, and one thing that gives us is a lot of flexibility. By being able to uh, implement the parameter server at the library level or at the application level, if we want to configure it differently, say we want to shard the parameters across multiple parameter servers, we can just start up multiple copies of this actor. Or if we want to switch from synchronous training to asynchronous or vice versa, or if we want to change the update rule uh, about how we update the parameters or handle stragglers differently or, um, or any other number of, you know, wire thing, the communication up differently, it's just a matter of these are all a few lines that need to be changed in the application itself. Um, so that's uh, one example of the kinds of benefits you can get from by moving things from this sort of system level to the uh, library or application level. Um, so now Stephanie's going to tell you more about the back end and the ideas we had to use to build such a scalable and fault-tolerant system. Thanks, Robert. Um, so here's the dynamic task graph, which Robert showed in the earlier example. And I'm going to show how we can actually execute this on a system. So I'll start with the design for a single node, and eventually we'll scale this up to a cluster. Uh, so the, each node has a scheduler, which is responsible for scheduling tasks in the graph according to their data dependencies. And we also have a couple worker processes. Um, so here, these are Python processes that are just waiting in a loop to be assigned tasks. Uh, the scheduler might decide to assign the first zero's task since it doesn't have any data dependencies. And the worker will begin executing this task. Once it's completed, it can store the return value of the zero's task in the object store. So it talks to this object store, uh, there's one per node. It talks to the object store directly to store the input and output values of each task. We also have a global control store, which you can think of as a fault tolerant key value store, which holds all of the system metadata. So in this case, that might be the object locations uh, for all of the objects in the cluster. It also includes what's known as the lineage of a, t of a piece of uh, data. So here, the lineage is the subgraph of the dynamic task graph, which describes for a given object what tasks were required to create it. Uh, so here, the lineage of the object that we just created is just the zeros task. So the scheduler would write this to the global control store, and as we'll see soon, this is important for fault tolerance. 
So next, if we want to scale this up, uh, let's say that we now have multiple nodes that all look identical. We want to make sure that there are no bottlenecks in the system so that we can scale up and get increasing performance with every node that we add to the cluster. Uh, so these nodes might execute tasks independently. So this third node might execute the other zero's task and store the second object in its own object store. It might write that location to the global control store and also the lineage of the other zero's task. So these schedulers can talk to each other directly in order to transfer data from one node to another. And they can also forward tasks from one node to another. And so that lets us implement policies for better load balancing and also to optimize for things like data locality. So I won't go into too much detail here, but two of the key decisions that we made for scalability is one that we made, or we have a fully decentralized DAG scheduler. Um, so this is uh, scheduling the DAG, the dynamic task graph of data dependencies. And we also have a sharded key value store. Uh, so we're very careful to make sure that the global control store doesn't become a bottleneck, and we make sure that every operation touches only a single key. Uh, so just to walk through a simple example of how we actually schedule a task, let's take the third task in the graph, the dot task. Uh, so here the driver, which is the process that's creating all these tasks, submits the dot task to its local scheduler. And that scheduler logs the task to the global control store. Uh, and we do that so that we have the full lineage of the dot task. Again, this is for fault tolerance, uh, so I'll show that in a, in a few slides. So now let's suppose that the scheduler decides to forward the dot task to another node, and I might do that, for instance, because that node already has one of the dependencies available. So that node will see that it only has one of them, so it has to retrieve the object data for the other dependency, and it would do that by asking the global control store for the locations of the other object. And it can then request the object data directly from the other node and re receive the value in its own object store. So now all the data dependencies are available, so the scheduler can assign the task to one of its workers, and that worker will return the value uh, uh, that returned by the dot function inside the object store, uh, where you can now retrieve it with ray.get. Okay, so this is sh sort of shows the flow during normal execution, but what happens when there's a node failure? So in Ray, one of the goals is to be able to support both long-running uh, jobs and also jobs that can scale up to many, many nodes. Uh, so node failure is inevitable here. Uh, so now let's suppose, same example, except before we were able to transfer the object data to the node that needed it, uh, the one that had it failed for some reason. So now this is bad because we don't have a copy of that object anywhere in the system, but we need it in order to execute the dot task. So what we can do here is actually rely on the lineage that was stored in the global control store. So this is a pretty classic idea. What you can do is just walk the lineage of the dot task and see which dependencies are missing, and then replay any of the tasks uh, that we need to produce those, uh, those objects. So here we can re-execute the second zeros task just by assigning it to one of our local workers. That worker will return the value object two inside the local object store, and now we can assign the dot task same as before. So we're able to fully re-execute just by re-executing the single task. So what's really nice about this technique for fault tolerance is that recovery can be really fast. And that's because you only have to replay the work that was actually lost. So in that previous example, we only lost the data, object two, and we only had to re-execute one task in order to get it back before we could continue executing. On the other hand, this actually adds significant overhead to normal execution. And that's because you have to do this extra work to record the lineage of each task. Um, so this is the part where you're actually logging the lineage, that dynamic task graph, to the global control store. And you have to do that during execution if you want to be able to recover. And as I'll show in a few slides, it's actually important that you do this, uh, this commit. So you want to make sure that the task lineage will survive in case there's a failure. Uh, you have to do that before the task actually starts executing if you really want to make sure that you only have to replay a minimum amount of work. So this is one example of a key trade-off in systems design where you actually have this uh, trade-off between fast execution when there are no failures versus getting fast recovery when there is a failure. Uh, so another alternative technique that shows the opposite end of this trade-off is actually global checkpointing. Uh, so in that method, you don't log any of the lineage at all during execution. Instead, you just take a global checkpoint across all of the workers in the system. So that means you're adding minimal overhead during execution. On the other hand, once there's a failure, even if it's just a failure of a single node, 
uh, you end up having to roll back the entire system to the most recent global checkpoint. And that, in general, if you have a very large cluster and a long-running job, that might actually end up wasting a lot of significant work. So in the past, because of that trade-off, uh, lineage reconstruction techniques have been really successful in supporting applications that have coarse-grained tasks. And what I mean here by coarse-grained is tasks that run on the order of seconds. Uh, so you can think here of big data processing systems like Spark or Hadoop, where they're really worried about getting high throughput. So the latency for a single task doesn't matter so much. Uh, but for the applications that we're targeting, we're actually looking at applications that have a high throughput of many fine-grained tasks. So these might run on the order of milliseconds. And that includes applications that Robert mentioned, like stream processing, graph processing, interactive queries, and also end-to-end -end reinforcement learning applications. So all of these applications have a large number of tasks per second uh, that each run on the order of milliseconds. And the reason that milliseconds uh, thing is important is because if you think about an application where each of the tasks takes only a millisecond to run, but then you have a system that's adding maybe 10 milliseconds of scheduling delay per task, that's already a 10x overhead uh, that's just added by the system. So the goal for the rest of the talk is to see whether Ray can get uh, both fast task execution when there are no failures, as well as fast recovery when there are failures. Uh, so this is kind of a rhetorical question, but uh, so yeah, we're gonna show first why previous lineage-based solutions end up being slow when there are no failures. So that's to demonstrate the trade-off that I mentioned earlier. Uh, next, I'll show how Ray actually avoids the execution overhead um, that we see in these previous solutions. And finally, I'll show the benefit that we see for Ray applications. Okay, cool. So in previous solutions, uh, the main technique for correctness, uh, so being able to recover from a failure, is just to commit the lineage first. Um, so first we'll see, we'll walk through an example and see what happens if we don't do that. Um, so now we have a lineage storage at the top, which is the global control store from a few slides ago. And this is a fault tolerant storage system uh, where you can write a task's lineage uh, to the storage system and guarantee that it won't be lost if there's a failure. Uh, at the bottom, we have two uh, independent nodes, each of which is running their own scheduler. And we're gonna submit a simple application to the first node. Uh, so this is just two tasks, one of them dependent on the other. And we're gonna begin by committing the lineage uh, to the global storage. But here, we're not gonna wait for that commit to finish. So we're gonna try and schedule the second task immediately to the other node, uh, which accepts it for execution. And now what happens is, in the case of a node failure, you're not gonna be able to recover completely. Um, so here, if this first node dies, um, normally what we would do in lineage reconstruction is walk the lineage of the second task. Uh, but now that lineage is actually here, we never wrote it to the global storage, so it's not available anywhere in the system. And so that means now the second node actually can't re-execute its task, or it can't execute its task at all, uh, and the system can't make progress. So the solution here is pretty simple, which is just to wait for that commit to happen first before you schedule the second task. Um, so here we want to wait for the lineage storage to accept the task, and then we wait for an acknowledgement back that the task has been committed. So now it's safe to schedule the second task uh, to the remote node, which accepts it for execution. And now let's see what happens if that first node dies. Uh, well, because we know that the, the lineage has already been committed, we can retrieve it from the lineage storage, and now the second node can continue to make progress. So this is just a simplified example, but the main point to show here is that you have to pay this round trip to the global storage system before you can execute the task. So that's on the critical path for task execution. And this might not seem like such a big deal, but if you think about it, you're actually having to do this fault tolerant write uh, to a remote system. And this is also uh, represents a bottleneck in the system. So if we have, for instance, a very high task load at a certain point in the system, we're gonna end up adding high, uh, increasing queuing delay at the lineage storage system, and that means increasing queuing delay for every task that we execute. So the goal in Ray is actually to try and get predictable performance uh, for task execution. So we wanna try and avoid any bottlenecks, at least on the critical path for task execution, and just sort of defer this step uh, to later on in the execution. So the idea is pretty simple, you just commit the lineage later. Uh, but now the main problem is, just, is being able to guarantee correctness uh, now that you no longer have this uh, sort of centralized source of truth. 
So instead, we'll now have a lineage stash at each node, uh, which you can think of as an in-memory subgraph of the global dynamic task graph, and we're going to use this to guarantee correctness. So now, instead of writing the lineage first to the global storage system, the first node will just write the lineage to its own stash, uh, which is really fast because this is just local memory. And now it's safe to forward the task to the remote node. But this time, instead of just forwarding the task, we also forward along with it any uncommitted lineage. Uh, so that's any lineage in our local stash that hasn't been committed in the global storage system yet. This task will add the lineage, or the other node will add the lineage to its own stash and then accept the task for execution. So here you can see we've basically taken that step to the global storage system off the critical path. Um, instead, the only message that we're using is the one needed to forward the task from one node to another. And we can actually now commit the lineage to the global storage system in the background. Uh, and this is mostly so that we can keep the size of the stash small. <clears throat> um, so now if we look again at what happens when there is a node failure, um, we can see that because we forwarded the uncommitted lineage before, now the second node can retrieve the lineage from its own stash and continue executing the graph. So basically what we've done here is get uh, the total number of steps required in terms of the number of messages required um, down to the minimum of just scheduling the task from one node to another. But we have this added benefit of being able to guarantee the same correctness as if we committed the lineage first. Um, so I'll show next the benefit for applications. Um, so here we have a distribution of latencies. Uh, so this is the latency between task submission and then task execution. And I'm measuring this in a simple application where we're just forwarding a bunch of tasks from one set of nodes to another. Uh, and in this case, it's at a rate of 2,000 tasks per second per node. Um, so here, this is the version of Ray without any fault tolerance at all. So what I've done here is basically just turn off lineage logging completely, uh, and it just forwards the task immediately. So this is really the minimum required uh, in order to execute a graph. And you can see here that the latency is actually really predictable. You have a relatively small tail, uh, and all of the tasks complete within tens of milliseconds. So that's in contrast to the design that I showed earlier where you have to commit the lineage first before you schedule the task. So I'm showing three different curves here uh, where I'm increasing the rate of task submission uh, from sort of half the speed of the earlier one to the same rate. So even at the lowest rate of task submission, you can already see the gap in latency between the version without fault tolerance versus the one with fault tolerance. And as we increase the rate at which we submit tasks, you end up getting arbitrarily high latencies, and that's because the, this sort of central storage it becomes a bottleneck. Um, so what we've done here is we got fault tolerance, but we had to trade off latency during normal execution in order to get it. Um, but what we do in the lineage stash is actually show that you can get both of them together. Um, so what I just did was add a curve uh, onto this graph that actually exactly overlaps the version that doesn't have any fault tolerance at all. Um, so we're essentially getting fault tolerance for free. We get the same latency as if we didn't do any logging at all, um, but we're actually able to get fault tolerance. Uh, if one of the nodes dies, we can always recover it. Okay, so today uh, Robert and I presented Ray, which is a system for writing parallel and distributed Python applications, uh, and it's meant to unify the ML ecosystem. And I gave a brief overview of how Ray uh, enables fault tolerance so that you can get both uh, fast recovery without uh, when there are failures and also fast execution when there are no failures at all. Uh, thank you. We'll take any questions. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so you do have to do a little bit of extra work in order to make sure that you can clean up the stashes at every node. Um, but the point there is that you can, uh, well, so there are two things. Uh, one of them is that it's not necessarily to actually write the task. You only need one of the nodes to do that. Um, and the other thing is that you can also scale up the global control storage. Um, but the point here is that like, you can actually get consistently low latency uh, no matter what the current throughput of the storage is. <laughs> 
One of the nice uh, things about this design where you have separate schedulers and separate, a separate metadata store is that you can scale these things independently. We should also repeat the question. Oh, oh sure. Um, so the question was uh, basically when you have uh, this more decentralized algorithm, whether you end up having to do more work, um, possibly on the global control storage, because now you have to commit the lineage at multiple nodes. Um, there are multiple policies that you can take uh, to make sure that only one node writes the lineage. Like a simple one is just wherever the task was submitted, you just write it there. Um, so does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But the point is that, so there's the latency of sending that initial message, which you have to pay anyway. Uh, and now, like, what you're doing is adding the amount of data that you have to send over, but that data is relatively much smaller to send yeah. compared to the latency of the initial message. Yeah, yeah no, it seems like a reasonable trade-off to make. It's yeah. Just, it, yeah. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of parallels between this and, like, uh, shipping a distributed log around. Yeah, in a way. So you can think of the lineage as a log. Um, it's just a, a very structured log where we know that it's a DAG. Yeah. All the way in the back? Yeah. Right, so I think you're asking, so the, uh, oh, sorry, the question was how do you know uh, what other nodes are free? Um, and so you can, this is sort of a question about scheduling policy, uh, which we're not really gonna cover in this area, mostly because. Well, can, uh, you can say a little bit, right? Yeah, but, so yeah. I mean, so we, the goal there is to basically mimic a centralized scheduler with a decentralized scheduler. Um, and so some of the things that you can do uh, are basically pass around resource information between the nodes uh, so that each of the nodes can make decisions on their own. And then there, there's like some extra work that you have to do to make sure that you make a good scheduling decision uh, since now you're working off of stale information. Uh, but we can talk more about that yeah. offline if you want. Because each node has a slightly stale view of the entire system, um, we don't assume that we make perfect scheduling decisions up front. It's possible to make bad scheduling decisions, um, but then we can always correct for them and uh, tasks can be, can be moved back or spilled back to other machines if the load on a given node is too high. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Thorn Broads earlier on as like a you know bespoke system that you would want to replace with the you know as a library like that would use Ray. Do you have an example of local GCP training using Ray? Um, so we do have an example. So the question was uh, we mentioned Horavod for distributed training as an example of a system that could become a library. Um, so we do have an example of distributed training and implementing primitives like all reduce on top of Ray. Um, in these cases, we are, we are absolutely still using um, existing deep learning frameworks, so whether that's TensorFlow or PyTorch or something else. Um, we are not building our own deep learning framework, but we are treating them as uh, essentially as single node libraries that do, uh, and we'll, we, in that case, we let TensorFlow handle um, uh, distributing computation across multiple GPUs within a single machine, and we use Ray to coordinate the uh, scheduling and uh, data transfer across machines. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a situation like that, do you ever experience, um, I'm not sure if TensorFlow is like greedy in that way, but like, is it ever a case that one of your workers wants, let's say, all four GPUs in a machine, and you have two workers on that machine, and you've been doing this, do you have any faster experiences like that, and, and, and does Ray account for that? So the question is, what if you have a single task that wants to use all the GPUs? Um, that absolutely is the case for, um, for things like TensorFlow. And we let each task, um, the user can specify the resource requirements for each task. So you can say this task requires uh, eight GPUs or, or whatever. And then, uh, then it is, uh, we don't, uh, th and then it's up to the, uh, the actual function or you to tell TensorFlow to actually use those eight GPUs. But we'll do things like set the CUDA visible devices and other uh, variables like that. Um, yes. Yeah, um, so which parts are written in which languages? So uh, most of the code is in C++. Um, 
And uh, actually, if we look That's at this, public. yeah, this picture. So the object store, uh, the scheduler are all in C++. Um, the global control store is, implement, is just um, using a collection of Redis servers, uh, which is an in-memory key value store. Um, the workers are Python processes, and they, but there's a client library implemented in C++. Um, and we also have uh, Java workers that can implement, um, uh, that can, so we can have a Java front end or other, because the whole system is language independent, um, and the data layout we use is, a, is actually language independent as well. We're using a uh, data format uh, defined by this Apache Arrow project, which is um, essentially a really exciting project that lets, um, enables, uh, Share, using shared memory between all of these processes with, without deserialization. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is but the object store allows uh, all of the workers read the same memory, uh, read the same objects through shared memory and um, don't have to create their own copies or, serial, or do expensive deserialization. Uh, so that's an important performance optimization, especially on large machines. Um, and uh, and we, we have libraries mapping Python objects to and from uh, the Arrow format. Um, and uh, we're also, one situation that a lot of people have is that a lot of production uh, code is written in Java, but a lot of the machine learning ecosystem is in Python. So right now we're working on um, enabling cross-language uh, function invocations and stuff like that to, um, to better support this use case, where you have, you know, you're streaming or uh, production code in Java and you want to uh, invoke a lot of the machine learning uh, stuff you have in Python. Um, does that answer your question? Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Is the, the shared memory, is that within a node or is that across nodes? It's, uh, it's, the question is, is the shared memory within a node or across nodes? It's a single machine shared memory as opposed to distributed shared memory. Um, and that's actually something we developed originally as part of Ray and have since contributed to the uh, Apache Arrow project because it's uh, something that makes sense as a standalone uh, or is useful independent of Ray. Great, I think we can take any other questions offline. So thanks a lot.